Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth edition of the Inner Space Masters Conference and Award Ceremony. This year for the first time ever in a virtual format. On behalf of the DLR Space Administration and the Inner Space Initiative, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all the partners. Namely, there are this year German Aerospace Center, the ESA Business Incubation Centers, Bavaria and Northern Germany, and Hesse and Baden Württemberg. We have Airbus, we have OHB, and DB Netzage. Now, we're all so excited to meet all the finalists and winners later in the afternoon, so be there when the overall winner will be revealed later. And yes, there is one other thing, uh, an exciting new element on our agenda. We will have the Audience Award later on. More on this later. But now, the first thing is that I'm delighted to welcome your host for this event, Dr. Walter Pelzer, who is the member of the DLR Executive Board and head of the DLR Space Administration. He's here to open officially this Inner Space Masters Conference. Dr. Pelzer, the floor is yours. Dear Mr. Rixkens, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Dear Thomas Jatzombek, Mr. Petschke, Mr. Agwip, Mr. Lindenthal, Mr. Bertling, Mr. Weiland, dear finalists of the InnoSpace Masters, dear ladies and gentlemen who are joining us today virtually. I welcome you to the InnoSpace Masters Conference and Award Ceremony 2020. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person. It was planned that we get together in Berlin, but due to the COVID crisis, it's not possible. I'm positive that you are used already to virtual meetings. Nevertheless, I prefer to get in person together, but this is not possible today. The challenge this year is under the title of Innovation for Sustainable Infrastructure. We choose this title due to the fact that important infrastructure on Earth is only possible and, and secure due to the fact uh, that we can handle it with space technologies. This is the reason why we are looking for new ideas how to handle the space or the, the infrastructure on Earth, not only safe, but also sustainable. Here we have a few examples, for example, out of the area of logistics, telecommunication, tracking goods on ships, for example, agriculture or energy. We are looking for ideas, but we are not looking only for spin-offs, as described over here, and also spin-ins. Here we have some spun spin-offs of a project we are actually um, funding by the by the DLR Raumfahrt Management. Um, on the left hand side, you can see um, the detection of water leakages in remote areas, so that we actually work over there. Um, a very important uh, topic uh, we can tackle with with Earth observation data is um, the production of uh, electrical uh, production in in, in uh, some areas, which is important to maintain and to keep stable our electrical grid. And due to the fact that we have uh, uh, an increasing uh, impact of our climate, um, it's clear that we have new ways how we can actually transport goods in the pool regions. And to do this uh, in a safe way, we can use uh, Earth observation data as well. And having this idea is not the final destination of this challenge. What we want to perform and what we want to uh, uh, foster is the transformation of an idea into a product, into a successful product. And this is something we are doing with our partners, with Airbus, with OHP, with Deutsche Bahn, Netze, and of course with ESA. And this is what um, actually it's all about, that we jointly together get uh, good ideas into an excess, uh, in successful business program. As I already mentioned, it's not a one-way street. We are looking in both ways, not only spin-offs out of space. We want also to get good ideas 
from other branches into space. And here we have two, two examples, actually two examples, uh, two winner of uh, the last year's challenge. On the left hand side, you can see how we actually, uh, or actually a company, it's not we, it's a company who performs based on big data analysis, um, tracking of um, hazards for, for small satellites and uh, makes so, especially for smaller companies, um, the tracking and the hazard of uh, space debris uh, more cost effective, let's it say this way. And on the right hand side, we are actually coming uh, and, and introducing a technology um, usually or, or, or originally developed for the automotive industry. It's 3D printing or adapt, 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 adaptive, additive manufacturing. Sorry, it's kind of difficult word for me. Um, I called it stereolithography when I was young. Um, it's a technology where we actually can um, come up with, with um, construction and with a setup and a design of product, which is with usual uh, manufacturing technology, it's not producible. And um, so we come up with designs which are more cost effective due to the fact that their weight is not as, as tough as, as uh, products when we go by, by usual manufacturing technologies like milling and drilling. And on the other hand, we can come up with designs which are definitely not possible with other technologies. So from this point of view, a big step we actually can do within space based on input for, with spin in from other technologies. This is what's uh, all about with uh, InnoSpace Masters. And finally, I would like to thank again our sponsors um, Airbus, OHB and Deutsche Bahn. And I would like to thank to uh, my team who prepared this conference and this challenge, uh, Ms. Zeitler and her team uh, who worked on this conference. Thank you very much and I wish you an interesting conference. So, Mr. Rickskins, now it's up to you. Thank you, Dr. Pelzer. And I must say, I'm quite happy I'm not the only one stumbling over words such as additive. Uh, additive. <laughs> Here we go. Now, as we've heard, this year we focus on the topic innovations for sustainable infrastructures. And of course, the question, what contributions can space make? But there's also the question, what contributions can the European Commission make? Our first keynote speaker will provide us with exactly that answer. So we are pretty excited to learn more about how space technology, data and even services have become indispensable in our European lives. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the European Commission Director for the European Union Space Programme, Mr. Matthias Petschke. Hello, I'm, I'm glad to be able to address this, uh, you in this uh, virtual format today at this uh, InnoSpace conference. Glad to be with you. My name is Matthias Peschke. I'm the Space Policy Director at the European Commission. And I've been asked to focus my introduction on European, European space infrastructure. So here we go. It is not common for a public administration like the one I'm representing, the Commission of the EU, to own and operate large and complex infrastructures. But our space infrastructures are a true European success story. They are an excellent example that Europe can achieve great things when competences and resources are pooled and when all work together for a common goal. When we speak about European space infrastructures, we mainly think of our flagships, Galileo and EGNOS, uh, our space uh, our satellite navigation systems and Copernicus for Earth observation. In both areas, we have come a long way and we are at a level where our success is recognized worldwide. Let me outline briefly where we stand with the Galileo, with Galileo and Copernicus and where we are looking at for the future. In Galileo, we have now almost reached the state of the system that was envisaged as full constellation. We have 22 operational satellites in orbit coming close to the number of 24 that are required to guarantee permanent worldwide availability. And there are some more satellites in orbit, especially the two launched in 2014, but injected 
in wrong orbits. We are close to completing the technical work needed to integrate these two satellites into the system. As of next year, we will also start to launch the first of the 12 so-called batch three satellites. This will complete the constellation, make it more robust and resilient by adding spare satellites into space so that we are always at a good number when satellites come to the end of their lifetime. More important, our services have proven to be of excellent quality. We've been delivering initial services, as you know, for almost four years now than, uh, than, uh, since December 2016. And the service performance, in particular in terms of accuracy, is constantly clearly above the declared minimum levels. It is widely recognized as being of excellent performance. And the number of users' applications being developed are continuously rising. We are now far beyond 1 billion of Galileo-equipped devices. Now it is time, however, also to look at the future and to make Galileo fit for the user's expectations of even better performance. We've been working on Galileo second generation for several years and will in the coming months conclude an important procurement procedure in this regard concerning the first second generation satellites. Given the pace of our competitors, we need to be as agile as possible. This concerns both the public sector and its procedures and industry. We want the first of these new satellites to be launched before the end of 2024. This is the challenge. And we are putting everything in motion to achieve this. Early acquisition of long lived items, front loading of key developments, test beds, etc. The new generation will provide all the services and capabilities of the current first generation, together with a number of improvements, new services, and capabilities. There will be a bigger platform and more power on these new satellites. There will be more flexibility, advanced designs for key components like the navigation antenna and new features like inter-satellite links. Also on the services side, we work on several innovations. Already based on the current infrastructure, we will introduce service features that will distinguish Galileo clearly from other satellite navigation systems. Open service navigation methods, message authentication, very much uh, expected by the market. A high accuracy service, highly relevant uh, also for the market, especially for connected uh, driving and a variety of uh, high technology areas. Service declaration is expected for 22. We research further innovative services based on the second generation. Just two examples, emergency warning service, warning population in a certain area when there are emergency events such as natural disasters, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. And also the ionosphere prediction service. Let me go to Copernicus. Copernicus is the worldwide reference in terms of Earth observation data. 280,000 users registered, space component with currently eight dedicated Sentinel satellites in orbit, an extensive operational ground system for data information processing and data access. For the ESA operated Sentinel missions, it corresponds to about 20 terabytes per day of fresh Earth observation data and a volume retrieved by the Copernicus services and other users of about 250 terabytes per day. Copernicus data is used in many areas, for instance, in case of natural disasters, floods, forest fires, etc. Also used recently obviously, to monitor, monitor the effects of the coronavirus crisis, traffic jams at borders, air quality, water quality, etc. But also for Copernicus, we need to respond to user expectations and policy needs of the future. First of all, users expect stability and continuity of the current Copernicus services. And that is why for all the six Sentinel types for the units are currently under development. The next one to be launched will be Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, named in honor of the former director of NASA's Earth Science Division, a joint project with NASA. The launch is going to take place on the 10th of November. The purpose of the satellite is mainly sea level measurements. Also in Copernicus, together with ESA, we are considering new additional technologies in accordance with the EU's policy objectives. We are currently studying several potential missions that could be added in the future. 
Let me highlight one of them. That is the top priority, CO2 monitoring. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen clearly stated her ambitions to make Europe a global leader in the fight against climate change. In particular, the European Green Deal plans to transition the EU to a carbon neutral economy and to make the EU a front runner in knowledge, technology and best practices for a healthy environment and a thriving economy around it. Monitoring of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, and in particular the estimation of the human contribution to these emissions is not yet feasible at a global level. The new CO2 mission should therefore provide accurate and consistent quantification of anthropogenic CO2 emissions and their trends. The selection of the further new emissions is planned for in about one year in the second half of 21. In addition to these flagships, we have ambitions in other domains. The space program for Europe will include activities for secure communication and space surveillance and tracking. This is why we are eagerly awaiting the adoption of the space program regulation and also the final budget allocation for the next seven years. The EU Council in July provided a better overview of the MFF. The latest commission request for the space budget was just below 15 billion euros in current prices. A word about secure connectivity. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has underlined in her recent State of the Union speech how important universal access to internet is for citizens in our time, practically as important as access to electricity and water. This is why the Commission is currently assessing possible options for developing a multi-orbital satellite system for providing secure connectivity. It would provide high-speed broadband availability throughout Europe, removing dead zones and ensuring cohesion across member states' territories. And it would provide reliable, secure and cost-effective governmental communication services. Let me come to an innovation. Space infrastructures are great assets, but all of this would not be possible without the innovation capacities of the European space industry and the research institutions, and not only upstream, but also downstream. Space infrastructure projects will never be considered a success. if There are no users, no applications. We have a thriving sector of highly innovative companies in Europe, including small and medium-sized companies and startups, as well as top-class research centers and universities. The Commission has promoted the emergence of a European new space segment through the Copernicus and Galileo business development programs, prize competitions, and the pilot investment fund. The ambitious goals of the EU space program cannot rely single-handedly on government-run programs. The dynamics of the private sectors has to be unleashed. The Commission has launched the Cassini initiative announced in the SME strategy that will provide a toolbox containing a space investment fund, business acceleration, matchmaking with investors and price competitions. We want to build on successful pilot projects such as the ISAP, the InnoFin Space Equity Pilot, which is a fund of 100 million euros to mobilize more private investment for space companies. Through this fund, our implementing partner, the European Investment Fund, invests in European venture capital funds focused on investment in space companies operating in both upstream technology and downstream data application. Under the InvestEU program, we intend to expand the supply of investment capital to space companies for small and medium-sized enterprises, including startups and scale-ups, to small and large mid-caps by providing financial products in collaboration with our implementing partners from the EIB group. Prices are another way of propelling European companies forward. In the frame of Horizon 2020, through the European Innovation Council, the Commission opened a competition to develop a low-cost space launch solution for launching by satellites into low Earth orbit with a 10 million euros price that we will award next year to the winner that best addresses this challenge. This type of inducement price can stimulate development in a specific direction 
and greatly help the company to commercialize their solution. It can also facilitate in raising capital from private sources. All in all, it's low cost, a low cost way to go far out into space. A word about Horizon Europe, the EU research program, which is organized around clusters. Space is part of cluster four on digital industry and space. Here we also plan to support actions of interest to both the EU space program and the EU space community, such as IOD, IOV, critical technologies for non-dependence, international cooperation, education and skills. The original request of the Commission for this cluster four overall was 15 billion. In July, the European Council proposed a budget cut on Horizon Europe close to 10%. However, there's going to be the recovery package of measures under the next generation EU in the context of the COVID crisis. And we obviously hope that this package will at least in part compensate for the cuts. We therefore hope that we will get a substantial budget increase compared to Horizon 2020, where we had 1.5 billion euros for the seven years on space. We are now in the hands of the European legislator, both on Horizon Europe and overall with regard to the EU space program. The Council and the European Parliament have to agree on our budget. On the program side, we need to ensure the continuity of our programs and the possibility for an ambitious evolution. Both the upstream manufacturing industry impacted by COVID measures and the downstream services industry want us to innovate and we need to go digital and green if we look at the policy priorities as just identified also in President von der Leyen's State of the Union speech. This requires strong action from the European co-legislators allowing for the budget, which is in line with our ambitions and the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias Petschke, also for the commitment of going green and digital. Now, our next keynote speaker is also very committed to a fair and sustainable world, Dr. Heba Agib. She studied both engineering and medical technology and is now CEO of RESPOND, the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant. Dr. Heba Agib is firmly convinced that technology will play a major part to reach the sustainability targets of the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. That's the name of her keynote, Innovative Startups as Pioneers for sustainability. Now, we are very interested in learning more about these technical pioneers, and I'm very happy to present to you Dr. Heba Agib. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to be with you today um, here at uh, InnoSpace uh, Masters. Um, to talk to you about innovation, about entrepreneurship, about the role of startups as pioneers who can contribute to a more sustainable uh, future and how to integrate sustainability in the core of business models, of innovations, and to be responsible for each and every development we do and how we contribute uh, to our societies, our economy, and the environment. Of course, we are all aware that it's a very challenging time. We have a, a very critical time in our life and um, uh, not only the climate uh, crisis or Corona or all of the short term uh, um, uh, uh, problems we are facing, but there are global challenges everywhere around the world. And we need to very, very much be conscious about how we are contributing with technology and innovation to a better and more sustainable future. 
the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN Agenda 2030 are uh, setting a plan on how we could contribute to this change. It's a politically defined agenda, but is showing how the different areas and fields can interact in order to achieve a more sustainable development in 10 years. We are 2020, so it's not far away anymore. Um, and there is a necessity to tackle these problems. So um, I think we agree, all of us, that it's no longer a question if we should act uh, towards a better and more sustainable future, but it's about the how. So um, instead of uh, showing you today a lot of uh, numbers and statistics about um, how sustainability and sustainable business models can be, um, even in some cases, more profitable profitable um, while having an impact, I would like to quote here um, politicians who are um, really um, believing in the power of startups and entrepreneurs as agile, as creative energy to contribute to the change needed. And they play a, ma play a major role in uh, our economies and uh, societies. And this is why we should put a lot of attention uh, to um, entrepreneurs who are trying to uh, contribute with their solution to a more uh, uh, sustainable um, society, economy, and ecology. And this is where RESPOND, uh, a BMW Foundation accelerator operated by Ontanema Tum, comes into play. We launched um, this accelerator program believing in the importance of supporting leaders of the future. And uh, because we are concerned at the BMW Foundation about responsible leadership and the role that each and every individual plays towards uh, how uh, um, the future looks like, it was very important for us to be actively working with startups, with entrepreneurs, um, and bringing in the power of networks globally in supporting them to scale up. And this is uh, what we started this year, um, and uh, luckily we just uh, were celebrating yesterday the first cohort in our demo night, and it's amazing to see how much support we can give each other, and network partners, stakeholders, opinion leaders can, in the interaction, um, uh, support and improve growth um, and uh, sustainable thinking and um, bringing a framework of innovation uh, uh, in business and in technology. So responders exactly acting in the intersection between uh, political decision and will, the Green Deal, the whole importance of um, how to tackle global challenges with science and innovation. Um, the economy, society are playing a big role in defining the challenges we need to solve. Um, and, and we believe that a new generation of entrepreneurs um, is uh, very much needing empowerment for that. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer myself and I know how difficult it is to, to be covering up uh, questions like uh, how to bring your product into sales or uh, your innovation further from a marketing perspective, business models development, and, and this is all what um, innovators and young entrepreneurs need to bring together. And this is exactly where we are trying with, uh, with them to uh, understand their need, their journeys, what they would like to achieve, and bring the right players together in order to implement the change needed. And again, as I mentioned, responsible leadership is a key factor and a mindset that helps us understand where the journey should go and how we can um, contribute with, what, with our day-to-day -day work for a better future. Responsible entrepreneurs, responsible investors, responsible politicians and intersectorial uh, in the different areas are needed. It needs a lot of coaching, a lot of competence, uh, mentorship. Um, and again, I want to highlight the importance of networks, of uh, identifying the right partners to be working with you on the solution you want to bring further to have the, um, the right mindset and be having a value system that you can interact with and think is, is according to what you would like to achieve um, on the way and uh, go through this journey together. So 
Besides the competence, it's very important to, uh, to, to be inspirational and to understand how to together um, uh, see examples of uh, people who achieved uh, uh, already on their pathway to uh, a sustainable solution and see how you can interact and further develop this uh, um, with them. And, and this slide is showing um, how much need since we identified, uh, um, so since we launched Respond and said we would uh, uh, would start uh, for the applications, we we identified SDG eight, nine, and eleven: decent work and economic growth, uh, industry innovation, infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities. And we had over four hundred applications from all over the world, which shows a very urgent need to tackle uh, uh, um, these issues um, in the frame of sustainable development goals. The selected startups are amazing. Uh, please, if you want to see how innovative and sustainable business models can be set up, innovative technologies with the responsibility in the core of the business models, check them out. And I will pick up Hawadawa as an example for a startup that brings together information from space. Um, they have a collaboration with the European Space Agency um, and the funding um, also with the LMR as well as their own sensors and, and uh, hardware all over the cities, uh, capturing air quality uh, data, bringing together all information needed, and intelligently trying to support uh, health, economic, economical, uh, and ecological issues. Um, it's, it's very important to be conscious and aware of the role you could play in your day-to-day -day work and with what you are developing towards a more just and sustainable future, and in the different areas where need is uh, defined and well known. It's, uh, it's just about how to tackle it. It's a long pathway. I think you all um, uh, uh, know that it's so important to have the right strategic partners. Um, to, when you are pioneering, you need to identify where you, your strengths are and where you uh, need to uh, fuse and interact uh, with the partners that are like-minded and are uh, pushing in the same direction. And this year, for example, with the Via Versus Viro starting to tackle the corona crisis and, and, and finding solutions, we were very happy to interact and we worked very closely together, uh, bringing in master classes, bringing in, in, in our experiences and knowledge, and also learning from this very dynamic and new uh, setup to contribute to uh, a challenge that is very much um, uh, uh, concerning the society and its development. Uh, as I mentioned, the demo night was yesterday. We've been very proud and um, accelerating and, and improving uh, your business model and seeing where you can go to the future as a, a founder, as an entrepreneur, um, in an established company, but also in a startup, there are so many different ways to contribute or to work on, on, on uh, your own uh, uh, vision, your purpose, and um, bringing together a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs to interact and learn from each other's experience is an amazing experience for us and for them. Um, and this is how uh, we can build a, a, a more positive, more uh, sustainable future together. Um, it's very important to be aware of your intention, of your purpose, and when developing technologies and innovation, to take those to serve and to uh, uh, push um, solutions further. So we can all rewrite what's possible and we can work on solutions for global challenges. It just needs us to be responsible leaders that know how to uh, um, to change and they have the strength to implement the change needed. Thank you very much. There is an old song by Tony Rennes. It goes along, Dimi quando du verai, oh, like this. So I, I don't worry, I'm not going to sing. But it says, quando, 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 and that's exactly the question for today. When will be the next round of the Inner Space Masters 2020-2021. Now, the answer is in the kickoff, and it will be announced today. 
So, for today's kickoff, we would like to welcome on stage Dr. Franziska Zeitler, who is Head of Department of Innovation and New Markets at DLR Space Administration. And we also have the Managing Director of the AZO Anwendungszentrum GmbH Oberpfaffenhofen, Thorsten Rudolf. So, Thorsten, the stage is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the InnoSpace Masters Kickoff 2020-21. The InnoSpace Masters Innovation Competition as part of the InnoSpace Initiative by the DLR Space Administration is looking for world changers with new ideas, applications and business cases for the next space generation. Since 2015, more than 1,200 participants from more than 20 European countries have submitted 412 innovative proposals. Today we are launching the fifth round of this innovation competition together with our strong partner network, the German space agency DLR, Airbus Defense in Space, Deutsche Bahn Netz AG, OHB, and the German business incubation centers of the European space agency, the ESABIX. Are you a visionary or a team from a research institute, a startup or a small and medium-sized company? Or you are an industrial company looking for solutions through a new partnership? Then you have come to the right place. This year's innovation contest attracted 316 participants from 15 countries, which underlines its strong international coverage. The partners of the InnoSpace Masters received 117 submissions from research and industry. Offering outstanding technical know-how and expertise, our partners form the backbone of the InnoSpace Masters. The close collaboration in the competition drives the innovation transfer of knowledge and technologies for the future space sector. The 15 winners of this year's competition have been determined. A jury of experts selected the most visionary innovation projects. The winners of the five competition challenges will present the projects today at the prestigious InnoSpace Masters Conference and Award Ceremony. The overall winner of the competition and the first place in each challenge will be announced and awarded at the conference. Be curious and stay tuned. The main beneficiaries of the InnoSpace Masters are small and medium-sized enterprises and research institutions from outside the space sector, providing new processes and technologies from traditional industrial sectors. The technology transfer is an important goal of the DLR InnoSpace initiative, with 68% of all submissions from non-space sectors the InnoSpace Masters fully meets this objective. But awarding these project ideas is only the first step. In the second step, these ideas must be further pursued by the teams, which we support by the prices of our challenges. The example of Deployables Cubed over a winner in last year's ESA Big Challenge shows that this is the case. Started as a student team, they have constantly pushed their idea to reach the long-term goal of developing actuators and deployables that are specifically designed for the emerging market of small satellite constellations. The team founded the deployable cubed GmbH at the end of 2019 after entering the ESA Big Bavaria incubation program. Currently, the team is working on the first in-orbit demonstration, which will be launched on board a rocket of Axis Aerospace on October 29th at the Spaceport America in New Mexico. This great example underlines the possibilities offered by the Inner Space Masters and the motivation with which the projects are continued afterwards. Thank you, Thorsten. The project Deployable Cube is a very good example for ideas we are looking for with the InnoSpace Masters. Beside this project, we have further 56 winners in the last five years. And the winners received more than 6 million euro of funding and prizes. Now let me show an overview of the range of the projects. We call this the InnoSpace Masters project portfolio. 
you can see here on the slide the main fields, for example, satellite components, structures, or uh, systems, small satellite uh, manufacturing, and uh, satellite communication. But we have also the fields of infrastructure like launchers and SSA. Important for us are also the services, Earth observation and navigation. And the last year we focused on the cross-sectoral transfer to medicine, health and nutrition. 57 logos represent companies, uh, research institutes and universities. Now, today, we want to start the next round of the InnoSpace Masters, and hopefully, we will improve and initiate, we will in initiate more innovative projects in space, on Earth, and maybe between space and Earth. The motto of the upcoming round is Innovations for Sustainable Infrastructure in Space and on, and on Earth. In the last years, more and more economic and social challenges are related to the main goal, sustainability. And many political papers and guidelines are also related to this topic. For instance, the well-known European Green Deal, the German Sustainability Strategy in 2018, and last not least, the stabil uh, Sustainability Strategy of the uh, DLR, the German Aerospace uh, Center itself. All this paper rely um, on the 17 SDGs of the United Nations. And our competition focus on the SDG 9, the resilient infrastructures, the industry and fostering innovation. We have a new motto for our competition, but the basic concept remains. The innovation process is a multi-stage process. Normally, it starts with an idea based on technology trends or user needs and ends with a successful market entry. And the five ch challenges of our competition covers the whole innovation process and value chain. First, we have the DLR challenge. We are looking for um, technology development and demonstrators, and the target groups are companies, especially SMEs, research in institutes, and uh, universities. The winners can get uh, funding up to 400,000 euro for a two-year period. The next step is the challenge of the ESA Business Incubation Center. The target group here are young scientists, students, or funding teams. And the winners can get support for making a business plan or assistance for an application for a two-year incubation at one of the ESA BICs in Germany. And the third step, our industry challenge, the integration phase. We are very happy that we have three industry partners, the Airbus, OHB, and DB Nets. And with these three global players, we can offer a good market access. The target groups are science, industry, startups, or individuals. And the three in industry partners offer uh, attractive um, prices. Let me uh, say something about this. Airbus um, offers the possibility for pitch at Airbus Venture and Airbus BizLab Accelerator. And um, make possible a pitch of a crowd investing campaign. OHB, the winners can get a pitch at OHB Venture Capital and get an invitation to an international event and technical support. And the DB Nets uh, AG, the winners have the chance of a 100-day proof of concept worth 25,000 euro they can get a mentoring program and access to the DB Mindbox Accelerator program and can get a pitch uh, at the management board of DB Nets AG. I think these are attractive uh, prices in, our, in all our um, challenges. 
And at the end, our projects we are looking for should have a relation to technology transfer, spin-in or spin-off pro projects. I hope that you are curious to know how can I get in the InnoSpace Masters. You have an idea, then you choose the challenge that fits to the idea or project concept, and then you should register and submit. What is the timeline of our next round? Today we have the kickoff. Then the submission phase is from October 30 until 5th of February next year. The evaluation will be until April of next year. And in June and July, we want to uh, make a um, conference and an award ceremony, hopefully uh, personal and not only virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, now we want to start the new round of the InnoSpace Masters. Thorsten, are you ready? Franziska, yes, I'm ready. Okay, then let's start with the countdown. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Lift off. Wow, that's what I call a real kickoff. One not with a whimper, but one with a bang. Now, but before we get ready for the sixth round of the Inner Space Masters, we will still have some inspiring hours ahead of us. Now, an in initiative like this one is only as good as the partners and supporters of this initiative. As already mentioned, a number of partners have contributed to the success of this Inner Space Masters, and I'm pleased to welcome them now for a panel discussion. The panel relates to the focus of the new competition round, which is called Innovations for Sustainable Infrastructures in Space and on Earth. So, I will ask the panelists one after the other, and I'd like to start with a member of the DLR Executive Board, Dr. Walter Pelzer. So, the collection of satellite data already represents an important basis for sustainability research, we know that. But it also enables many projects which contribute to reach political sustainability goals. This also applies to the area of infrastructure, as addressed, for example, in SDG 9. Now the question, what are the main arguments to underline the systemic relevance of the space industry for sustainable infrastructures or for terrestrial sustainable development? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, space services today are very closely linked to various economic sectors and infrastructures on Earth. A failure of satellite services would have far-reaching consequences. To be very clear, if we shut up all satellites, if we shut up technology uh, or space technology, we would actually beam decades into the past, 40, 50 years. So from this point of view, um, it's clear that space, agent, uh, space agencies actually have, have two main topics to tackle. On the one hand side, we have to come up with reliable services on the one hand side, and we have to make sure that in light of quicker, quicker, faster, faster development processes, we are coming up with new services. But for both pillars, one thing is important. New set of services have to be in light of the evolving commercialization of the market, of the bigger, bigger market um, and, and let's say traffic in, in space. Both systems, both pillar have to be sustainable. This is an important task agencies have to tackle right now. Okay. Thank you. Now, our next partner has supported the Inner Space Masters from day one onwards. It is Airbus. And I have the pleasure to welcome the head of business operations, space, Airbus defense and space, Andreas Lindenthal. 
Welcome. Mr. Pelzer has already mentioned how closely interlinked satellite services are with terrestrial infrastructures. Now, the question to you, in which areas do you see the greatest potential for Airbus to make infrastructures on Earth even more sustainable in the future? And how can Airbus contribute to that? Even more important compared to ensuring the sustainable utilization of space, of course, is to protect our living environment on Earth. So to protect Earth, to contribute to monitoring, supervision of the Earth situation. And we do have multiple solutions which can contribute to a protection of the Earth's environment in a very efficient way. So communications from satellite in order to provide state-of-the-art logistic services to minimize the uh, contribution of uh, gases into the atmosphere and also to provide I intelligent solutions in order to make, let's say, economy more efficient on Earth. Disaster management is a very important aspect which is using satellite and space technology uh, already very extensively. So communication of all the teams which are providing on-site disaster support and uh, also navigation, Earth observation, very important in order to allow teams and institutions to assess the criticality of uh, the situation in order to optimize the utilization of support teams on site. Also on the technological area, space technologies can contribute to protecting the environment, to protecting the climate in the future. The technologies which are being developed in the area as an example of solar generators, so state-of-the-art of uh, solar power with a very high efficiency compared to, let's say, what we had available a couple of years ago, uh, can contribute also to solutions where it says that we can generate energy more, let's say, sustainably more and uh, more protecting the environment while using carefully the technologies and the energy which we have available. Now, our next partner, OHB, has also supported the Inner Space Masters since the very beginning and has offered a pretty dedicated challenge for the last three rounds. Now, I'd like to welcome the member of the management board from OHB, Dr. Lutz Bertling, to our discussion. OHB is leading the industrial syndicate which, funded by the European Union and ESA, is implementing the new Copernicus project CO2M. Now, starting in 2025, CO2M should be able to analyze the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere very precisely and also determine, and that's the cool thing about it, that its origin down to the region or city, thus, of course, helping to track the effectiveness of terrestrial targets and measures. But the question now is, how did the project come about and how important is this project in the strategy of OHB and also are there any other satellite missions in which OHB is involved which contribute to climate protection or sustainable infrastructure? CO2M is obviously uh, part of the European Copernicus program, one of the flagship uh, programs of the EU and for me honestly it's the most important mission within Copernicus um, because this is the mission which monitors the Paris Climate Treaty and if you don't monitor such a treaty then at the end it's very difficult to judge how nations have, have complied to it. So it's a very important mission and it's a very important mission for OHB as well uh, because for us it's entering into a new part of the domain of Earth observation. It's entering with one of the most important missions, the Copernicus program overall, um, in, in which in the first sequence 
The first set of missions, we were not very much present. Now we have a very important role in the second um, generation of Copernicus, if you want. And uh, therefore, a very important mission in terms of capability, which we will build up, a very important mission in extending our portfolio to this part of Earth's observation. But a very important mission as well, because it contributes to what mankind will know about climate change and how mankind will be able to influence climate change. And therefore, beyond the business perspective, it's very important because we believe with this mission, we can contribute, uh, it's a big word to say for a better world, but uh, at least we can contribute to getting climate change better under control. I see. Now, as already mentioned, DB Netz AG is the latest industry partner to Inner Space Masters this year and the first company coming outside of the space domain. So a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Christian Weiland, the Chief Technology Officer from DB Netz AG to this panel. As a railroad company, DB Netz AG operates about 87.5% of the German rail networks. Now, for the first time as a partner of the Inner Space Masters, you're looking for innovations and new approaches from the space industry. Now, what are the main challenges resulting from this increasing concentration of freight traffic on rail? And in which space services do you expect the highest transfer potential? Yes, challenges. <laughs> challenges we have a lot at the moment. So challenges concerning capacity um, are the, the main ones now. The capacity of the railroad networks remains the same and we expect um, an increase of uh, freight traffic. So um, increases at the moment, uh, increase of capacity slowly powered by construction, extending capacity and construction of new lines. The second driver for more capacity is digitalization. But the planned growth of traffic freight, uh, freight traffic is much faster. This leaves us uh, with the following cha challenges. More, more efficiency in planning and operating our maintenance measures needed. And the need for shorter interruption, sure, because we need more capacity uh, on the tracks. We have the challenge of retaining quality the punctual of trains for our customers while handling traffic peaks and increasing freight volume. And at last, sustainability of an aging infrastructure, rails, catenaries, signals, for example, due to more and more extreme weather conditions. Now, what are space service deliver for us? So space technology is highly specialized on specific use cases. The same as railway infrastructure. And we are looking for people who are able to customize the products and technologies to our needs. We expect experience in managing extreme conditions, heat and coldness, as in Space Branch 2. And personally, I made the experience that companies from the space sectors are very competitive in railway business. Well, a company known here, I learned now, Groove Satellites and Galileo is one of the key suppliers for railway energy control systems. And now uh, it ensures data security for track control today. So we're coming to the second round of questions. And um, I start with Walter Pelzer. You've already mentioned it with regard to the systemic relevance, it's also necessary to make space operations itself sustainable and, of course, future-proof. On the political level, various guidelines are currently in discussion, including those relating space traffic management, space debris mitigation, and environmentally friendly launch practices. So the question, where do you see the greatest challenges for the space industry? And what responsibility do you see in the private space industry for the future development of space travel? Mm -hmm. Okay. From my personal, uh, from my point of view, um, also I personally would say space traffic management is is the biggest challenge we are facing. Um, if we take into account that 
rocket launches will become cheaper and the number of satellites in orbit will be bigger and bigger, especially if we, if we think that uh, mega constellation will be in place sometime in the future. Um, space traffic management definitely will, from my point of view, the, the biggest challenge because um, it's an issue everybody has to tackle, but that nobody wants to take responsibility. And this is really, really an, an, um, an, uh, a situation which, which makes it really, really um, hard to, to tackle this issue. There's no business case right now in place to tackle it. Um, there's no governmental um, uh, common consensus in the world. This is the reason why I think it's, it's the biggest issue. We as Germany think that um, other than other nations who would like to gaze, go their own way and, and come up with their own solution, their own regulation, we as Germany think that uh, this is something which should be handled by the United Nations. But from uh, my point of view, also important, and this is coming to your question, is that the private sector has to be part of the solution. And uh, first of all, he has part of the solution by being asked, being involved in coming up with a solution, but also uh, being part in taking responsibility. From my point of view, um, the private sector has to take responsibility. He has to come up with solution with technology, for example, some kind of deorbiting systems to tackle this topic. This is absolutely necessary um, if we want to have a sustainable use of space in the future, that private sector is part of the solution, takes over responsibility and is aware that he has to spend money to also not only putting the satellite into the lifetime, but part of the lifetime is also deorbiting. This is my point of view. This is the biggest challenge because this is something which is not core competence of uh, and core business, let's say it this way, core business of the industry. Thank you. Mm. Okay, then now another question to Andreas Lindenthal from Airbus. It's a little bit longer. So, the need and associated challenges to keep satellite operations safe in the future, they are increasingly discussed. Now, due to the constantly increasing density of satellites in orbit, the risk of collisions in space is rising sharply, so that missions and infrastructures could be at risk in the future. The World Economic Forum has initiated the development of a Space Sustainability Rating, in brief SSR, which aims to create transparency on how organizations deal responsibly with the issues of sustainability and space debris mitigation. Now Airbus is a partner in the development of the sustainability rating. So the question to you, what exactly drives Airbus to be involved in the development of this rating and what role does Airbus play in the development of the SSR? And what are the key issues that should be considered for the sustainability of space operations? In fact, this is a pretty important topic. It's uh, very essential for societies that uh, the space utilization is still possible, that the access to space is guaranteed and not blocked by debris, which is endangering all the future space missions. So therefore, we as Airbus are actively supporting initiatives who are aiming at uh, preventing that more debris is brought into orbit and also initiatives which are dealing with the removal of space debris from the orbit as far as possible, which is quite a huge technological challenge. But uh, I think we have all the means altogether, space industry, space institutions, research institutes to provide technical solutions, programmatical solutions to make sure that uh, future generations can use the space and can use, let's say, all the future applications in a sustainable way for mankind and uh, for the benefit of all the societies on planet Earth. 
Okay, so my next question then to Lutz Battling from OHB. When talking about sustainability, natural resources are a key factor to be considered. Now, how can space technologies or space systems secure the sustainability of the global infrastructure on Earth when the population and consequently the natural resources needs are increasing? Now, if you talk about other missions in the same sphere, then yes, we, we have other missions where we are an important player. We are the instrument uh, prime for the Chimre and the Chime missions to other Copernicus missions. We are the overall prime for the Arctic weather satellite, which our subsidiary in Sweden is responsible for. But beyond this, we are doing missions in the hyperspectral area, um, with, for example, NMAP, one of the most sophisticated hyperspectral missions uh, you can find. But if we leave Earth observation a bit, there's other missions which are important as well. Take Galileo, where we have delivered all the full operation capability satellites for the first generation of Galileo. And if you think about new mobility, autonomous mobility, and so on, um, here Galileo will be very important. So sustainability goes beyond Earth observation. It goes as well into other areas, navigation being one of them. Um, and we are particularly proud about the missions which we are doing in these areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, from space back down to Earth and the question to Debbie Netze and Christian Weiland. How did the decision come about to specifically seek ideas from the space industry and how do you assess the potential of space services, for example, compared to other industries when it comes to making the rail network more sustainable? So, at first, it's the contact to the startups via DLR network, sure. So, and on the second hand, due to the ongoing digitalization, uh, we have an increasing need for technologies such as communication, data analysis, or resistance against extreme weather conditions, where the driving force behind our interest in collaborating the space industry. Your references and experiences using space technology and control systems in image and pattern recognition for example, on construction sites, uh, initial there, and recognition from satellites, innovative materials, um, robust and energy efficient electronic systems, and so on. There are very, uh, very much similarities uh, to space industry uh, with new applications which are ongoing digitalization in railway infrastructure. Thank you very much for these inspiring moments and inspiring insights into possible innovations for sustainable infrastructures. And I would say after so much food for thought, maybe a little time for some real food or at least for some coffee, tea or a little drink, because we have a break, a break of 10 minutes. And after the break, it is time for the thrilling pitches the exciting award ceremony and the announcement of the overall winner. So, see you in 10 minutes. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, yes, the pause is over. Sorry, it was very short, I know. You there, yes, please, please come back. Come back to the screens. We continue because it's getting exciting. Why? Because we're coming to the moment many could hardly wait for. Now, finally, the pictures of the top finalists and the award ceremony for the winners. So, today we have the opportunity to vote for the audience award. That's something totally new. So you can vote for your favorite pitch. You can rate every pitch from one to 10 stars. The more stars you give, of course, the better. Now, the voting will take place in your voting tool, Slido, which you can see here, right? So um, just open the website in your browser, scan the QR code, here or download the app on your phone that's also possible 
then please see the link to the event voting toll below in the comments and also find the QR code as you can see here again. Now every pitch, that's important, every pitch can be rated on Slido separately during the time of the show. Now please note, you can rate each pitch only until the next pitch is up in the program. In other words, the rating for the current pitch won't be available afterwards anymore. So please place your rating right after the pitch presentation is done. Now, that was my part. Now it's your part and we are looking forward to your participation. And of course, the participation of our finalists. Who will be the winner? The excitement rises, so let's start with our first group. There are three finalists in the DLR challenge and the first presentation is Dr. Ulf Kulau from DSI Aerospace Technologie GmbH. So Dr. Kulau, the space for the presentation and the pitch is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. And yeah, one issue when we talk about human space, that is that we cannot just go to a doctor when it comes to medical incidents. For this reason, health monitoring of astronauts have always been an important task for every previous and upcoming mission. But also on Earth, such a comprehensive monitoring of health conditions that we see, for example, on astronauts would be highly beneficial. So just as an example, in 2015, the cost for cardiovascular diseases exceed 46 billion euros, while 44% of all deaths in Germany are related to heart conditions. So for us, reasons enough to work on a technology transfer of ballistocardiography, or in short term, BCG. So BCG, which is basically the measurement of the ballistic force of the heart, has a strong connection to space applications, mainly due to the zero-G environment. However, with our sensor, BCG measurement also possible on Earth. Our prototype is able to measure even tiny accelerations with high accuracy, which enables a comprehensive health diagnostics. For example, what you can see here on the slide, we can monitor the actual heart's movement, including important biomarkers like valve opening and closing events. So now what we aim for, or first we, that is DSI Aerospace as an established SME for space electronics, user interface design as an expert for data analytics and UI, and as well as the medical school Hannover, we aim for a highly integrated BCG that can be used in everyday life for many terrestrial use cases, but also, yet again, extraterrestrial use cases when we have a look on the upcoming long-term missions in space. Thank you very much. Wow, cool. But now a question to you. Your technology is not only for health care, but can also save lives. Now, how important is this in your daily work? So uh, for me, um, on behalf of DSI Aerospace Technology, this is a really interesting question. So um, I would say for now, and without focusing on the proposed BGD sensor, I would say that we as a space company, we are always working on technologies to save lives. So actually what we are doing, we are building the infrastructure, for example, the satellite communication or Earth observation satellites like the Copernicus missions that are always a backbone for life-saving actions. But um, I think in this case, I would like also mention our partners like UID and of course the Medical School Hanover, um, who are for sure directly involved in, in, in saving lives. So um, considering now this proposed Dr. B project, um, it can be seen how our classical space industry and the medical institutes can collaborate in a perfect manner. So with Dr. B, even for us as a space company, the question of how to save life uh, using our technology becomes more and more present in our daily working routine. And um, yeah, I would say that uh, we are ready to take up this challenge. Okay, now we're coming already to pitch number two and I can tell you it's getting hot. Why? You will find out in a minute. When Dr. Christian Reimann from Fraunhofer IISB will talk to you now. Are you searching for new materials to increase the efficiency of turbines and rocket engines by using higher combustion temperatures? Are you searching for new materials which can increase the re-entry time, especially for 
thermal protection systems which are used in re-entry vehicles? Then HOSA could be the answer. We are developing wear and heat resistant coatings based on refractory metal carbides. These coatings give the possibility to increase the application field of carbon fiber based or silicon carbon fiber based matrix composite materials. These materials are typically used in space applications. The clue of the HOSA technology is the water-based spray coating procedure, which we developed at Fraunhofer ISB. The HOSA technology shows clear advantages compared to conventional coating techniques. First of all, it's cheap. It's quite flexible to coat large parts with difficult geometries. And third of all, it's very flexible for the reconditioning of already used parts. The HOSA technology was demonstrated very successfully in Earth for semiconductor processing, where very harsh reactive gases conditions and high temperatures of up to 2,300 degrees C occur. Let's protect your prefabricated parts together with HOSA. Yes, HOSA. But a question to you. Let's dream big for a moment. Where do you see your solution in five years from now? Okay, um, if we dream big, then my personal dream would be that the HOSA technology will be one time part of a space mission. And this would be, let's say, a great success for our HOSA technology. Okay. And already we are coming to the next pitch. The next pitch is all about security and QMSEC. It's called, well, I give you the full name. It's Quantum Memories for Secure Communication. And it's a group of three. There's Professor Yannick Wolters from the Technische University Berlin, Markus, Dr. Markus Kruznick, and Mustafa Gündogan, also from the Humboldt University in Berlin. We're excited. Let's see. Dear jury, secure satellite communication is a pillar of our modern societies. Examples are control of critical infrastructure or transport and logistic processes. To ensure future data security, it is desirable to include quantum communication in upcoming security architectures. Today, Satellite-based quantum communication is complicated and expensive. That's only attractive for governments or large enterprises. To allow a broader community, including small and medium-sized enterprises, to profit and participate in quantum communication, new paradigms must be followed. For this, we identified quantum memories as the missing key technology, and with CUMSEC, we will work on closing this technology gap. CUMSEC is enabled by the Heritage and Quantum Technologies for Space application, which have been supported by the DLR Space Agency since about two decades by now. We are building upon a toolbox of optical technologies, such as the Starning Rocket Proven Laser System, to meet the needs of a quantum storage device. In 2017, a position paper says that the market size of cybersecurity and network technologies is about 200 billion euro. In 2018, Bryce estimates about 160 billion euro for satellite communication. But besides the specific application of quantum memories in these market segments, the exploitation potential is even larger because the components may be used in other quantum technology applications as well as many other classical markets. So Kunsex uh, brings quantum memories to a TRL of five, and we need you to get an eye. Thank you. And I thank you, but if thanks to your technology, global quantum communication is secure, even over insecure data connections, now what does that mean for future security on the internet? Uh, thank you for the, for the question. It's a nice and quite a legitimate question. So within this project, we anticipate that this technology first be used by large enterprises, such as banks or governments for global financial transactions or uh, diplomatic transmissions, for example. But once mature enough, though, this technology will likely form the backbone of the future global quantum internet, uh, which would relieve us from the worry of our information being compromised.
for example. Oh, so we've seen three incredibly great pitches, but the key question is, who is the winner? And that is known by Dr. Franziska Zeitler and also Frank Meures, who is the project manager from Inner Space Masters. So the question to you, who is the winner and why? Thank you, Mr. Rickson. Ladies and gentlemen, dear finalists, now we have reached the award ceremony of the InnoSpace Masters 2020. We have heard the pitches of the DLR challenge, and now we go on to the announcement of the winners of the DLR challenge. Mr. Moires, the InnoSpace Masters project manager, will start with third place. Thank you, Ms. Seidler. As part of the jury board, I can say that the evaluation process of this year was very tough, not only in terms of the high number of the submissions, but also with regard, uh, with regard to the high quality of the ideas. Your ideas are the proof that the transfer between space and other sectors can lead to real innovation projects. But now, I don't want to keep you in suspense any longer, and I, and I would like to announce the winners of the DLR challenge together with Ms. Zeitler, who has initiated the InnoSpace initiative and as part of that, the InnoSpace Masters a few years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, I will start with the third place of the DLR challenge 2020, which is Dr. Christian Reimann and the team of Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Systems and DOS Technology with the idea HOSA. Congratulations. We are very grateful to, leave, to receive this honor of uh, the InnoSpace Masters Award. And I will go on with the second place. The second place of the InnoSpace Masters DLR Challenge goes to Dr. Ulf Kulau and the team of DSI Aerospace Technology GmbH with the idea Dr. Beat. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Moires. Now we come to the highlight of the DLR challenge. I have the pleasure to announce the winner of our challenge. The first place of the DLR challenge goes to Dr. Mar Markus Krutzig and his team of Humboldt University, Berlin and Ferdinand Braun Institute with their idea CUMSEC, Quantum Memories for Secure Communication. Congratulations and good luck for your project. Hey guys, what up? Look at this! What do we have? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow! Oh, wow! Very nice. Also from my side, congratulations to Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'm really pleased to welcome you to the ESA Big Challenge 2020 award ceremony, which will be presented by the Business Incubation Centers of the European Space Agency in Germany. And we are thrilled to see which of the three finalists will win the overall victory and an attractive support package for their startup companies. And we will start with a first finalist, and he is a bit like spraying metal on certain things. Uh, it's Dr. Alexander Schwand from Additive Space GmbH, and now we are going to learn more about it. So, Dr. Alexander Schwand. A big challenge for the space industry is the use of CFRP in the production process of tanks and structures. We proudly present our additive space approach to enhance the chemical resistance of cryogenic CFRP tanks. 
We plan to use the coat spray technology as additive manufacturing method for metal coating of CFRP material. A processing gas is heated in a spray gun chamber and accelerates the aluminium powder particle to high velocity. The coat spray approach has groundbreaking advantages. We can do classical coating and in addition spray brackets or mounting points directly in the same process. This will enable new designs and manufacturing processes. Due to the high energy, the powder particles melt and stick together while hitting the surface and build up a solid aluminium layer. The CFRP is shielded by a galvanically created copper coat. We can spray very thin layers, smaller than 100 nu, which enables a very low weight increase combined with high chemical resistance. The resulting material properties are comparable to normal aluminium alloy and we applied a patent for our approach already in 2019. Our final goal is to use our additive manufacturing approach to produce large-scale structures in space at the end of this decade. Mm. Now, let's imagine there are plenty of investors out there watching you. Now, why should they invest in your company? Honestly speaking, there are several reasons for that. We have an excellent team, a very innovative and proven technology approach, and already applied a patent. And furthermore, there is a huge market potential for our innovative approach. The team currently consists out of four highly passionate aerospace engineers with more than 50 years of experience. Furthermore, two of us have, have already established highly successful companies and worked for Roland Berger Strategies consultants. So we combine both excellence in aerospace engineering and entrepreneurship. The huge market potential, besides rockets and satellite industries, includes, for example, the aerospace industry. We think for Airbus, for example, it will be remarkably interesting to have a very light and highly resistant tanks for the future cryoplane fleet. And we can also address the boat industry for the boat hulls or even the automotive industry with their needs for cryogenic tanks in the future. Our technology approach is both proven and highly innovative. As mentioned in the pitch, in the midterm, it is the best opportunity to produce large scale structures in space. Even a supply of raw materials from the moon can be a possible scenario and that will change the game for building space stations or spacecrafts completely. Finally, today investors have a, un a unique opportunity. We have done the most of the preliminary work and we are ready to start. So we identified this groundbreaking ident additive manufacturing approach and we can start very fast to validate the manufacturing parameters and deepen our knowledge about this process. So we are looking for your calls. Okay, so dear audience out there, you imagine you're dressed, you're dressed well and everything is clean. Probably it was washed with water, but it can be different without water. Be clean without water. How? This will be shown with our next pitch. And it's Stefan Chang and Gernot Zimmermann from the Infinity Startup GmbH. People find inspirations in strange places. For me, it was my smelling running shoes. I love cheese as much as the person next to me, but not in here. Hi, I'm Stefan, CEO of Refresherworks. We kill orders and bugs. But more importantly, we tackle one of the biggest forgotten areas how, of how infections spread. The things we wear. From trying to solve my smelling running shoes, we created a patent protected device which has been proven to remove over 99.9% .9 of odor causing and harmful bacteria. And even more importantly, viruses. Yes, including coronavirus. No chemicals, no water, 90% less energy than the gold standard. This even works in space. Suitable for spacesuits, smart textile, textile with electronic, helmets and gloves. We are refresher box. 
killing viruses, smashing bugs, saving the planet, and cleaning up. Because this is a send of innovation. Thank you. Well, the first dry cleaning company for astronauts and astronaut suits in space really sounds spectacular. But you mentioned the virus, so let's think down to Earth. What significance could the refresher box have for humans now in the corona crisis? Thank you very much for this question. Face masks and other PPE are desperately needed throughout our world for the first responders, for the healthcare workers, but also for people in their everyday life. Yet there is no cleaning solution for these items. You need to repurchase them again and again and again. With the refresher box, we found a solution to disinfect, to clean, and actually refresh these items without water and without chemicals. And if you think one step further, this could be used for occupational safety, not just in hospitals, but all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, which leads us immediately to our next pitch. Now, we all know there are more and more satellites in space, but how can we keep them safe? Safe control of more satellites, maybe even with artificial intelligence. That's what our next pitch is all about with Vardan Semarijan from Stell AI Space. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Vardan Semarijan from Stell AI Space. Uh, with launch services getting affordable, the big players in a satellite uh, and commercial space industries are looking for ways to deploy and maintain large satellite constellations, which will enable great new opportunities to solve terrestrial problems in a cost-efficient way. Uh, it is projected that in the next uh, few decades, uh, the number of satellites in Earth orbit uh, will increase from a few thousand to hundred thousand. Uh, so manually managing such a large constellation uh, with the conventional ways and control centers uh, becomes quite expensive. Uh, so operators are looking ways to automate uh, the process. We believe artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning algorithms can support those efforts. Collision, egress avoidance, uh, the establishment and management uh, of the communication network, uh, health of the satellites, uh, those are all uh, problems which we believe uh, the uh, AI will be able to solve uh, and automate the process. So our solution will use uh, uh, data uh, already available from uh, hundreds of uh, constellation forming satellites already in orbit uh, as an input data to uh, train the machine learning algorithm. Uh, the resulting model uh, and uh, will be used to scale up the simulation with 100,000 of satellites use the uh, AI to achieve autonomy of the constellation. At some stage, we want to uh, look and be able to manage a large constellation, not on a single satellite level, but as a single complex but self-sustaining system. Thank you. Uh, just a little secret, if you wonder where I am, I'm standing here in Munich, and that's one of the reasons I have a special interest in the next question. Um, you have recently been included in the ESA big program of the European Space Agency, but why did you choose the incubator in Bavaria? Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for being chosen as a finalist of the uh, program. Uh, we, uh, we chose the location of Bavaria because uh, we saw uh, uh, in years, a very successful startups uh, starting uh, in this region and uh, becoming uh, already quite successful business uh, basis. And uh, we see these companies as well as a potential customer for our uh, services. And uh, the entire environment uh, is uh, motivational, energetic, and uh, the, yeah, I believe it's a bright future uh, in this region. So, thank you. 
Now we've seen three pitches, three great solutions, but there can only be one winner. And, well, there will be three winners, but one first winner. And who will it be? Well, I would like to welcome again Torsten Rudolf, Managing Director of AZO, and Frank Zimmermann, the Managing Director of CESAR, to announce this year's winner of the ESA Big Challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the award ceremony of the ESA Big Challenge 2020, which will be presented by the Business Incubation Centers of the European Space Agency in Germany, the ESA BICS. The two prime contractors of the European Space Agency in Germany, CESAR and AZO, manage this program on behalf of public and private stakeholders. For example, the Fraunhofer Society, the German Aerospace Center DLR, or well-known companies like Airbus, Bosch and Ariane Group. The ESA BICS in Germany have so far supported 303 startups with an annual turnover of around about 200 million euro in 2019 creating more than 4,500 high-tech jobs in Germany. ESA Big alumni have raised more than 500 million euros in venture capital since 2016. The ESA Bigs in Germany are the leading space incubator programs in Europe at seven locations in Bremen, Hessen, Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria, making the ESA Big program the driver of the emerging new space economy. The original focus of the ESA Big Program is the support of entrepreneurs who apply space technologies in a non-space environment, thus so-called spin-offs. Today, and actually motivated by this challenge, we also take the reverse path and support space spin-ins as well. The ESA Big Startup Challenge was therefore again looking for innovative startups that focus on achieving substantial progress in space commercialization. The winner of the ESA Big Startup Challenge will receive a support package, which is tailored to the requirements of its realizations. And this is, first, assistance in transforming the business concept into a viable business plan. Second, support of the application in one of the German ESA Big facilities and if accepted, you will benefit from 50,000 euro in funding. And third, last but not least, access to the Europe-wide network of experts, which can assist in both technological and business-related aspects. And now we come to the winners. I have here the envelope. I will open it. And now we see the third prize winner. The third prize in the ESA Big Challenge goes to Vardan Zemerian with his idea on Stell IA Space, Artificial Intelligence for and from Satellite Internet Constellations. Congratulations for this success. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, being nominated uh, as a finalist for the program. And uh, I think that is a good start. Uh, to uh, get the idea towards realization. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we come to the second place of the ESA Big Challenge. And I will open now the silver envelope. And the second place goes to Sing Hong Chang and team of Infinity Startup GmbH with their idea Refresher Box clear textiles from viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms. Congratulations. And now we come to the winner of the ESA Big Challenge, the first prize. This first prize goes to Dr. Alexander Schwand and his team of Additive Space GmbH with their idea on Additive Space, Additive Manufacturing Method for Metal Coatings of CFRP Propellant Tanks. Congratulations for this success.
Yes, and also congrats from me to Noises. Now, without further ado, let's go to the pictures from Airbus. Um, and we will start with the Airbus Challenge with a pitch that will show you some internet from the sky. Aircraft without pilot but with a lot of electricity. And what's the benefit? Well, you will find out from Daniel Kakao from AlphaLink. Hello and welcome at AlphaLink, the future of unmanned aviation. When I met my good friend from school, Alex, in 2015 in Sao Paulo, he explained to me that he was researching on a high altitude platform for Earth observation, for internet communication, through aircraft that are connected at their wingtips. I asked him, okay, like, you can do that, but isn't that science fiction? And I answer to him, actually, it's not. So shortly after the Second World War, the German engineer, Dr. Richard Vogt, emigrated to the United States and conducted some wingtip coupling experiments with manned aircraft. There were some problems with the roll control, but our solution is unmanned. So we conducted some first flight tests at the TU Berlin in 2017, and then last year we founded the Alphalink Engineering, and we will continue in this company the research to the North Aircraft. Together, we work on solutions not only for unmanned systems, but also for high altitude platforms. With our new prototype and a strong young team, we put the future of unmanned aviation into reality. We are happy that at this year's Inner Space Masters we were nominated as finalists in the Airbus competition and we hope that you find our dream as exciting as we go. So follow us and follow our vision on alphalink.space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But high altitude platforms can be an alternative or complement to the growing market of satellite systems in orbit. Now, is your system more of a niche product or do you see scaling opportunities? What we want to achieve is our AlphaLink X model for stratospheric operation throughout the whole year for Internet from the Sky. This I would not call a niche market, that's a huge market. However, from a business perspective, it is really important to have some intermediate products, intermediate services, and this is why the real question is, how scalable is the technology of the compound aircraft itself. The leap of our technology is the high aspect ratio wing. So we're getting a high aspect ratio wing, but we don't have any problems with aeroelastic effects because we have just small elements. And those small elements has not a long aspect ratio wing, they have small wing span. And with this, we have no structural issues. And also we can maintain the structural weight of the signal aircraft and thus we can carry more payload and take more payload with us. To bring the technology into the, the uh, real use case, we need more know-how. And this no, more know-how we develop at AlphaLink. With our company, AlphaLink Engineering, we are applying the knowledge in different commercial products and projects, for example, in research together with the German Aerospace Center. But we are also working on the small-scale model 813 that will be used for small-scale Earth observation. It will be able to fly up to 10 hours carrying camera payload uh, of six kilogram or different sensors, therefore enabling low cost, high resolution Earth observation, even as a first step. Mm. Which brings me immediately to my next pitch. And I could ask a question, a very simple one. What time is it? That simple. But what precise time is it right now? I mean, in terms of nanoseconds, now, that is very important in the satellite and space industry, and we will learn more about it now from our next picture, who is from GNSS, Common View Time and Frequency Synchronization, that's the title, from Melio Systems GmbH, and the name, Sergio Arten. Hi, let's meet for a beer, 8 o'clock. What about a meeting in the following days? How often were you late for your meeting while something went wrong with your synchronization? Let's think now about financial transaction in high frequency trading. You place your order just a bit late uh, of a few millions later than your competition. I'm sorry, you lost your competitive edge and now also your money. 
Global di digitalization drives the need for better timing performance in many industries. Now we are looking into the one digit nanosecond synchronization range. This is relevant for distant and remote systems like two financial venues across the Atlantic, digital mass deployment in dense urban areas like 5G or IoT, and highly distributed networks like, for example, blockchain. Our solution brings to the commercial market a technology already validated in the scientific domain, named Common View. This synchronizes two GNSS receivers in the one digit nanosecond range in a very cost effective manner, which also increases security and robustness of our systems. Timing is important for your 90 second pitch. However, timing is not only important, but essential for critical infrastructure and our society. Melior just presented you the solution. Remember the beer at eight o'clock and the meeting in the following days to discuss POCs or seed investment. We look forward to seeing with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, but there's also a new phenomenon in the space industry called new space. So with investors from the private sector. Now, how do you see the market opportunities for your engineering services in this growth market? Yeah, well, great. Um, new space, it's very interesting and we are new space. So for us, it's somehow um, a great opportunity to, to be part of this, this growing um, phenomenon. First of all, because we think that uh, in the marketing side of things, this is helping us. So thank you, Elon. We uh, now have a bigger reach to, to more traditional industries, let, let's say. They understand what uh, space assets are and um, how they can help their business. And uh, of course, second of all, we also can provide our time synchronization services, not only to finance, telecom, energy, or other traditional markets, but also to the new space itself. So I'm thinking about satellite constellations and IoT satellites. I'm thinking about you know a distributed uh, ground segment and um, antennas everywhere in the um, around the globe. So all these it actually can benefit from our um, time synchronization with very high accuracies and very cost effective deployment. Um, if we think in a global scale. Okay, so let's come to the next pitch, and I would like to start with a figure, 80%. 80% of all roads in this world are off-road, only 20% are paved. Now, what do we do? How can we recognize these 80%? Well, you will find an answer in the next pitch from Bearways GmbH and Mr. Moritz von Grothus. My name is Moritz van Grotus. I'm the founder and CEO of Bearways. Together with my technical partner, Dr. Sacha Clement, we founded Bearways in 2019 in the beautiful town of Lübeck. What is Bearways about? Bearways is a data company. We are targeting a surveillance and information service related to transport lines all over the world. And under transport lines, we understand roads, we understand railroads, but also gas electricity lines. How do we do it? Our core technology is based on artificial intelligence. For that, we need a database built out of topological maps, street maps, but also weather data, and of course, for the global coverage, satellite data to enable an artificial intelligence based analytics. These analytics provide the necessary information on how is a road drivable? Is a transport line okay? Does it function well? How do weather events or other events like bushfires or avalanches affect these transport lines? We're really happy to be part of the InnoSpace Airbus Challenge with our project Tikal and are very much looking forward to a great event. Hmm. You have a slogan on your website and it reads Beyond Urban Mobility, how to reach even the most remote destinations in the world. Now, what sounds more like Easy Rider to me has enormous economic significance in the third world countries. So do you want to become 
the new Google for the old uh, for the off-road sector? That's that's a great question. Um, but I, I would like to put two angles on that. The one thing is. Um, well, Google is a gorgeous company. We love to be the next Google. And Google started small too. Um, but we have to be realistic and we have to think about the core of our technology. And the core is a data layer. It's a data layer of how do transport lines on a global scale um, work? How can they be maintained? Um, how are they affected by, by whatever kind of events? So we would see ourselves more like a supplier to Google and to comparable companies like here or TomTom, but just as well to mobility companies, to automotive tier ones or automotive OEMs, but just as well to companies like Airbus as a data supplier to facilitate and improve their database for decisions of their vehicles as well as for their companies. On the other hand, off-road is always a bit of a tricky word. Um, if you think in one extreme, you might be thinking about the niche of people driving with non-registered vehicles somewhere in the outbacks of nature, just cross country. And we think more about transport lines as infrastructure and how do we probably use those to maintain nature, to enable better lives and to enable a better economical status in these regions. Wow. Now we've th seen three great pitches. And honestly, I'm glad I'm not in the skin of Mr. Andreas Lindenthal because he has to choose who was the best. So let's hear who was the best of the three, Mr. Lindenthal. Thank you very much, Mr. Rickskins. Now we are coming to the most important part of this event. So out of an impressive number of candidates which have submitted their proposals for very innovative, very intelligent, clever new ideas, we are coming to the top three innovations we have selected out of the competition. So first of all, let me thank you all the teams which were contributing in this competition with their ideas. It was pretty impressive what spectrum of different ideas we had, how innovative those ideas were, which uh, we could assess. And uh, it was pretty impressive. And consequently, it was pretty difficult to select the top three ideas out of this spectrum. We as Airbus are looking for proposals which are contributing to our role as enabler and solution provider to customers, to society. And we found three ideas particularly interesting and innovative. And I would like to highlight that by now coming to the top three prizes which we are awarding as the outcome of that competition. And let me start with the third pla place, which goes to Dr. Daniel Kako and his team of the Technical University Berlin. And the idea, which is called AlphaLink Compound Aircraft Network. Congratulations for this outstanding contribution. And now we are coming to the second place. And this prize goes to Sergio Artin and his team from Melia Systems GmbH with the idea GNSS come in view time and frequency synchronization for industry. Congratulations. The winner is Moritz von Grotthus and the team of Barways GmbH for the idea T 
vertical remote assessment of remote traffic routes. Congratulations for this first prize. And again, thanks to everybody who was contributing with his creativity, with his motivation, with his excellence. It was pretty impressive to see the number of ideas and the level of quality which you have contributed here in this competition. Thank you very much. Wow, we are really, really happy to receive this acknowledgement of our approach to global infrastructure. Thank you very, very much, Airbus. Um, thank you very, very much to the whole organizational team of InnoSpace Masters. Um, it's a huge pleasure and big honor to win this prize. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, also congratulations from my side to all winners and in particular to Tikar coming from south to north in Lübeck. Okay, before we come to the OHB challenge, I'd like to remind you that you have the possibility to vote for your overall winner, the Audience Award. And don't forget, it's the Slido you can use. Give five, six, seven, eight or nine or ten stars for the people you like best or the pitches you like best. Having said that, we are going now to Ireland a little bit. Uh, with the OHB challenge, we go to Dr. Matthew Kelly and Linda Ferrelli from Mars Taurus and let's see what they have for flying pictures from Mars. Hello, I would like to introduce you to a new type of craft called the Mars Taurus. It will provide a deeper understanding of the landscape and atmosphere of Mars. Taurus will bridge the gap between the high altitude data gathered by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is 400 kilometers from Mars, and the rovers, which provide great data but travel very slowly. The Taurus stays in the atmosphere at a height of two kilometers and can reduce its height to ground level if needed. This allows Taurus to take the high resolution images and to study the atmosphere at different locations around the planet. Taurus is unique as it contains a vacuum allowing it to float without the need for a gas and so it can stay in the atmosphere for four years until the battery life ends. Power comes from solar panels and it, and it communicates directly to Earth via X-band to the deep space network. Taurus weighs just 14 kilo and has a diameter of 18 meters. Taurus can be stored in a small area on its way to Mars, where it is inflated during entry and stays in the atmosphere without the need to land. Coincidentally, today, 14 of October, Mars is the closest it will be to Earth for the next 15 years. We hope it won't be another 15 years before Taurus gets this close to Mars. We are currently looking for partners to join us on this exciting Mars journey. Thank you. Hmm. Now, the landing of humans on the red planet is an ambitious goal of mankind. However, a mission to Mars is also an expensive adventure. What is your strategy to realize your Mars Taurus project? Mars Taurus won't actually carry humans to Mars, but it will autonomously gather high resolution data at a height of just two kilometers. Um, this will be able to locate safer landing spots for future manned and robotic missions, and also to find locations of water and other minerals. Um, Taurus can also be used to um, find safe paths for rovers and even find lost rovers. But to get to Mars, um, we have proven Taurus mathematically the next step is to recreate the Martian environment and test materials and electronics so that when Taurus does get to Mars, it'll be able to withstand the harsh Martian environment. We will require, as Linda said, um, partners to help us get there faster. Okay, so let's come to the next pitch. And in the next pitch, it's all about optics. Now, you might think the more precise optics are, the more expensive. But maybe not in the next case, because we have uh, something called free form metal optics for new space applications. And it's presented by Space Optics and there, Dr. Matthias Bayer. 
So thank you very much for this kind introduction and hello everyone out there on your screens. My name is Matthias Bayer. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of the Fraunhofer IOF spin-off Space Optics. Space is one major future physical channel to enable human technological megatrends like worldwide connectivity or cybersecurity. But the physical channel itself is changing. We are nowadays talking about large constellations of hundreds or thousands of satellites that will provide data acquisition and exchange by optical technologies. As the number of systems increases, we want to produce them at lower costs and in smaller size and volume. Especially for the optics on board, it means that we have to guarantee nanometer surface quality for space-grade optical components manufactured in a serious production. At Space Optics, we want help to solve that scaling issue. We are a provider of optical mirror components and telescopes made out of metallic materials. Powered by 20 years of Fraunhofer research, our technology allows to produce high-quality optical mirrors in complex freeform shapes. This freedom allows the optical designer to shrink the system size in order to build everything as small as possible. Using metals as a base material, we can reduce production times and costs. Our processes are scalable to high volume production and the technology has already been proven in various space missions. At Space Optics, it's time for launch. Thanks a lot for your attention. Now, Dr. Bayer, you mentioned Fraunhofer. Now, Space Optics GmbH is a Fraunhofer IOF spin-off. What support have you received from your institute and the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft to make your dream come true? Okay, so um, great question. Thank you uh, for that one. Um, generally spoken, the Fraunhofer Society offers many very attractive programs to help founders and young entrepreneurs to commercialize promising technology. So in this sense, it's really a, a great ecosystem. Uh, Space Optics, so our spin-off is maybe a bit a special case here. So as we are working for many years already on that technology, making complex optical components and systems, uh, our main focus was not to establish a product itself or to verify the technological concept. So we are actually scaling the technology and offer it in an industrial environment and while, of course, adapting it also to uh, new applications. So our main focus is currently to realize the hardware at our own infrastructure. And that's also the reason why we did not participate at uh, all the programs that are offered by the Fraunhofer Society. But nevertheless, we received some great support from our institute, from the Fraunhofer IOF in Jena. And this was uh, first especially true for giving each one of us the opportunity to smoothly change over from the institute into the spin-off. And second, for already starting common research and development activities. So and I think that especially the second point, so working in a consortium of an institute and an industrial spin-off can be a big, big win-win yeah, situation for both of us. Okay, so let's come to the next pitch. And with the next pitch, it has to do with disruptive electric propulsion. Uh, it's all about neutron star systems. And we are very happy to listen to two people this time, Marcus Collier-Wright and Manuel Betancourt from Neutron Star Systems. Hello. We're neutron star systems, and with us, the future is electric. Our solution is a disruptive electric propulsion system incorporating high temperature superconductors. And with this combination, we will solve the dilemma of power upscaling in space and enable a new set of market scenarios for high power space missions. This technology is fundamentally German. We're located in Cologne. Our main scientific partner is the University of Stuttgart, and our main partners for developing the superconductor systems is the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and Teva, based in Munich. Supreme technology is the combination of applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters with high temperature superconductors. And this combination enables us to reduce the mass, power consumption and volume of the thruster, all the while increasing its performance and its lifetime. Supreme technology has five key competitive advantages. Firstly, a wide propellant flexibility, enabling operation on alternative propellants such as argon and ammonia, which are two orders of magnitude cheaper than the status quo xenon, and also enabling hybrid propulsion systems to increase spacecraft maneuverability. The technology is simple and robust, 
and is backed by over 60 years of research heritage, including right here in Germany. The technology is highly scalable. We can scale it over a wider range of power classes than any of our competitors, and it's highly throttleable, allowing us to operate it over a wide range of conditions, making it suitable to almost any mission application. With these competitive advantages, Supreme will enable a new generation of spacecraft missions. And remember, with Neutron Star Systems, the future is electric. Okay, now what are the key differentiated features of your product and why do you think this has the potential to revolutionize the space sector? Uh, the main differentiating features of our product are the three key competitive advantages of the propellant flexibility, the scalability and the throttleability. With the propellant flexibility, we overcome the existing dependence of electric propulsion systems on xenon, which is a very rare and expensive propellant. With the scalability and the throttleability, we enable new mission scenarios and can apply this technology to a wide variety of different applications, including cargo missions, space weather warning systems, and high throughput communication satellites. The combination of these three key differentiating factors increases the sustainability and the capabilities of the future space industry. As for why it's revolutionizing, I'll let my colleague Manuel explain. Um, I think the major impact for revolutionizing space is based on, uh, it gives us a new opportunity to rewrite the current technology roadmaps. We can uh, do a better use of the com competences that we have built in Europe and in Germany over the past years and maximize these competences towards the development of a technology that is sustainable. It also gives us the opportunity to uh, reconsider our geopolitical position uh, 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 in the current world scenarios and uh, give us also the opportunity to build new partnerships with the source of Ukraine, New Zealand, the United States, Japan, Luxembourg and the United Kingdom. So I think that this is uh, one of the major uh, um, reasons why we can revolutionize space. Thank you. Thank you. Now, again, what a variety of solutions. Did you find it difficult with Slido to find the right one? Well, not only you. The same is true for OHB and there, Dr. Lutz Bettling, who had to somehow find one winner out of the three. Thank you, Mr. Richards, and I'm super happy to be here again and to have the opportunity to present the winners, they are in here, the winners of the OHB challenge. But before I present them, I would like to say a few words about uh, InnoSpace and the importance of this challenge. It's all about innovation. And innovation at the end is always driven by competition. I truly believe that nothing is a stronger driver for innovation than competition. And at the end, we want to increase sustainability. We want to increase, as we spoke earlier, climate monitoring. We want to make a better world, or at least we want to contribute to making a better world. And for this, we need innovative solutions. And InnoSpace brings together many different people with different level of experience. You have young people, you have older people, more experienced, less experienced. You have startup guys coming up with lots of enthusiasm, great ideas, sometimes not that much experience, but at the same point in time, you have very experienced uh, uh, people who are bringing up ideas which they had in their mind for 10 years, they were circling around and then there was the one moment where they were able to bring it into a real idea, into a, a product, if you want. And I strongly believe that InnoSpace and competitions like InnoSpace, they are a driver for such people. They are a driver for creating enthusiasm, for bringing the right spirit, for challenging yourself and getting into a competition with others and just bringing your ideas forward. And we need them, we need the 
super young people just having left university but bringing great spirit great ideas but we need as well those who are building their ideas on a long life in industry or institutes uh, and lots of experience and this is exactly what inner space brings together and I'm, I'm very happy that every year over all the challenges every year we can really see great ideas here great initiatives and for us for OHB uh, it's really well, it's something special to be in here and to contribute to uh, to inner space it's an honor for me to be here it's an honor for me now to present three prizes, which are again in here, um, and to announce the winners of the, this year's OHB challenge. Now, let's make it reality. Let me have a check. Yeah, it's three cards. That's at least good. And, the third place in this year's OHB challenge goes to Dr. Matthew Kelly and team of Mars Taurus with their idea, Mars Taurus, continuous lift and navigation in the Mars atmosphere. Congratulations, great idea. And um, I truly believe one day we will be there. We will be on Mars and they are contributing to this step with their idea. Yeah. Now, the second place in the 2020 OHP Challenge goes to Marcus Collier Wright and team of Neutron Star Systems UG with their idea Supreme Neutron Star Systems Superconductor Based Magnetoplasma Dynamic Electric Propulsion. That's a for German tongue, that's a challenge even to say. Magneto Plasmodynamic. So great, great idea, uh, great success, and congratulations for the second place in this year's OHB Challenge. <laughs> now, the last one they should know now. Uh, the first place in this year's OHB Challenge goes to Dr. Ingmatthias Bayer and team of Space Optics GmbH with their idea, Space Optics, free from metal optics for new space applications. My big congratulations for the first prize. And again, I would like to congratulate all three teams. Um, it was not that easy for us to do the final selection, um, but I believe we have three initiatives here which are really worth being this year's winners of the OHP challenge in Innerspace. Thanks a lot and good luck to all of you. Yes, and congrats from my side to Space Optics in Jena. Now, for the very first time, we have a challenge, a new challenge, so to say, from DB Netze. And the pitches are also, there will be three pitches, and we will start with the first one, which is all a little bit about predictive maintenance. How exactly that works and why the pitch should be a winner well, you will see when Elmer's extensive road monitoring and early warning system is going to show what they have. It's from Taya, and please welcome Dr. Ricardo Cabral. 14 billion euros. That is the amount of losses on uh, roads and railway infrastructures caused by natural events every single year. And with an aging infrastructure and an increase in extreme climate events, this number will surely grow in the future. So now, more than ever, it is crucial to improve the resilience of our transport infrastructures. But to do that, we need to be able to perform large-scale uh, diagnosis and also regular monitoring, which can be quite challenging and expensive with the traditional survey methods. 
And that is precisely what Hermes does. It uses satellite data to continuously evaluate the stability of the entire network, no matter how large it is. Also, by integrating data from ground sensors, it gives you powerful data analytics that will significantly lower your maintenance costs. With Hermes, you can detect and predict the occurrence of structural damages and extend the lifetime of your infrastructure. Okay, but Taya is specialized uh, to safeguard cultural heritage by means of remote sensing. Now, you would like to use your services for monitoring railway lines. Now, how do you see your chances to develop this new market together with DB Netz AG? Thank you for, for the question. Well, so far uh, in our experience uh, working with other railway and highway companies, it has shown us that uh, during the development of a new product or a new service, it is quite crucial to work together with your potential users. Um, and by developing pilot projects, for instance, uh, we are getting a much better understanding of the features that uh, truly matter uh, to them and also adjust the, the product to actually cater to their needs. And um, with this knowledge, uh, you know that you are on the right track to, to create something that will surely be successful in the market. Uh, well, in this sense, being, of course, one of the largest railway companies in the world, um, DBNet would definitely be an invaluable partner in the development of Hermes. Okay, let's get to our next pitch. I'm pretty sure some of you have read Harry Potter, and you know that there are some dangerous trees in some of the stories. Now, from fiction we come back to facts and the question how can we detect dangerous trees you wonder what that is well you will find out with Ocel smart analytics on aerial imagery and it's by Ocel GmbH and there David Doman Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, it's a pleasure to be here and introduce Ocel to you my name is David Doman and what we do is aerial intelligence, meaning we don't only record high quality aerial imagery, but we also interpret that data for our customers, which are mostly in the field of forestry, where we analyze deep knowledge, deep insights of how forests perform and how to save them. So in our endeavors flying over forests, we also realized that Deutsche Bahn, who is a large forest owner, by the way, um, has many railways through forests and often there's trees dangerously nearby. So um, this is obviously a problem. We all know about how difficult it is for Deutsche Bahn after storms with uh, all the falling trees and, and the resulting delays. So this is why we reached out uh, for this project. And what we actually delivered um, is a quite successful product. We um, used our AI knowledge of interpreting individual trees, detecting them, classifying them. And also on the other hand, on the lower left, you'll see um, our height model. We can precisely estimate and measure the, the height of individual trees on a centimeter level basis. And we've used that data in order to detect risky trees which could fall onto the railroads. And letting Deutsche Bahn know this is very crucial information, and we're happy to provide that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But you also know that the aerial imagery market is highly competitive. Now, what is your unique selling proposition, your USP, uh, and your service of your services and your company? And what is your advantage towards competitors? Yes, uh, it's definitely true that the aerial imagery market is extremely competitive. There are so many solutions out there, so many competitors. And what we see is that most of them tackle an individual problem and an individual part of the value creation pipeline. Um, 
But what we also see on the other hand is that customers or the co companies that we actually want to approach, they have two overall problems. On one hand, they don't know where to get the data. And on the other hand, they don't know how to interpret that data. So these major overall arching problems um, have to be tackled individually by those companies and, and you need individual expertise for that. So what we try to do is tackle both of these and offer that as, as one service. So the companies, the customers only need to approach us and we take care of all the data generation based from different sources like satellites or our own aerial imagery planes and also interpret that data to extract just the meaningful information for our customers. And in our eyes, that's definitely the USP of our company that we can go all the way and have the whole value creation line there. Okay, so let's come immediately to our next pitch. Now, if you go by train, sometimes, you know, it's getting a li little bit late. Now, people found out that in 2018, there was a delay of approximately seven years for the intercity trains. Why? Because very often the rails weren't good enough because they had to be repaired. Now, that figure can be reduced. How? Well, you will learn that from our next pitcher, so to speak. He's from Panto Health, and it is Dr. Farzad Vizali. More than 2.9 billion euro just for the maintenance of rail infrastructure in Germany, and still 30% of the trains run with delay because the maintenance action are performing either too late or too early. The solution is predicting the best time and type of maintenance action. We collect data via our sensors and camera on the trains, like what we are doing for infrabel, and we generate data via simulating a running train over the infrastructure, like what we are doing for DB nets. We use both measured data and synthetic data to improve our machine learning algorithms and deliver predictive maintenance plan. Providing simulation as a service and using synthetic data are our USPs. In addition, we have a patented technique in our measurements. I'm Farzad Vesali, a PhD in rail engineering, furthermore, a master in software engineering, a PhD student in energy system engineering, and another master in, me in mechanical engineering are supporting me in the team. We started with the use case of pantograph and catenary, we got BSS scholarship, a simulation project with DBNets, a paid pilot project with Infrabel, the exist grant in Technical University of Berlin, and now we are looking for partners and more projects here. Thank you. More. Okay, but you are just in the startup phase of your company and you need financial resources for the development of marketing your product. Now, what forms of financing do you have in mind? Yeah, so far we are partially supported by Exist Scholarship, but we are actively looking for investment to grow our team and accelerate the development. As I said before, just for our first use case, Pantograph Catenary System, we already have two standalone products and each of them has separate markets. We need 4 million euro to get four years runway. It covers the cost of selecting and developing measurement hardware, the cost of research to develop mathematical model for simulation platform, and also the cost of development of our machine learning algorithm for predictive maintenance plan. This value is not only covering our first use case, but also enable us to extend our product to other components of rail industry, including tracks, wheel sets, tunnels and bridge and, uh, and et cetera. We have estimated that excluding our R&D costs in the middle of the third year, we can be profitable. However, our ultimate plan starts in the second year when we have plenty of data collected by our product and we will be able be, to build our pr predictive maintenance platform. It will generate another significant review for, our, for us based on the lens of infrastructure. 
again three very varied pitches and as you know variety is the spice of life but sometimes it can be agony because you have to select the right one so the agony of choice is now with the laudator from db netze and this is dr christian weiland so thank you for passing over so uh, welcome again i have now the honor to welcome all the part participants here on behalf of DBNets and to announce the three placements soon. But first, Immersion, we are all started small. It was in Berlin, it was Siemens Bell for telecommunication in, yeah, in the present Microsoft, Apple, each of our companies use choose a matching strategy. DBNets follows a predictive maintenance strategy strategy. So we heard a little bit about the ideas of our startups and we have we are convinced that earth observation and sensor technology plays an important role to capture current state of health of our infrastructure and even more to predict necessary maintenance measures. So we would a very good batch for startups that we wouldn't have found without our participants in inner space masters. But we are clear about three winners too. All of the three winners provide technologies that are highly useful for DBNets, useful to bring us a step further to the digital age. So I have this cover here, like you have seen before. No more sharp. Oops. Here are a few places okay the third place goes to dr ricardo cabal and team of theor with the idea extensive road monitoring and early warning system the second place goes to dr fazat bizarian team of pento health with the idea real-time conditioning monitoring and maintenance 4.0 And the winner is the first place, yeah, the David Dome and team of OCEL with the idea smart analysis on aerial imagery. Thank you very much for participation. So here we've seen this was the end of the pitch, but not the end of our day. After a 10 minute break, we will continue. So please get yourself a drink, get a small bite, and then we'll be back in 10 minutes. And welcome back to the award ceremony. Well, now it's getting really exciting because who is the overall winner we would like to know. Now, we're all on tenterhooks and I know there is someone who knows. He's in Berlin. He also has this burning desire to tell you who the overall winner is. And let me therefore call the Federal Government Coordinator of German Aerospace Policy, the Commissioner of the Economic Affairs Ministry for the Digital Industry and Startups. That's long, but now a shorter name. Welcome, Thomas Jarzombek. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak and um, all the best to all the participants of the Innospace Masters here today. And uh, it's a very big pleasure to see uh, vibrating uh, founders of uh, startup companies that engage in the new space business. And this is for the German government a very important issue. And we are fostering the startup ecosystem for many years right now with at least right now 10 billion of euros. And we have several tools for this. It's starting from the EXIST program for young founders starting from the universities. We have uh, further programs out there like the Hightech Gründer Fund or like Coparian, 
which are investing directly. We have a uh, scheme for uh, subsidies for business angels of uh, 20%. So for all the young founders out there, apply to this. It's called the Invest Zuschuss Wagner's Capital. You get a tax-free 20% subsidies for business angels. And especially we have the huge programs like the IEF uh, ERP uh, Dachfonds, which is investing in VC funds together with the European Investment Fund and the RKFW Capital, who is doing almost the same. So these are very huge packages for supporting uh, the startup ecosystem. And right now to this 10 billion euros we are founding already, we will increase this amount of a further 30 billion euros beginning in the next year, calling our future fund in which we will support measures that we are doing today, like KFW, Coparion, Hightech Wunderfonds. But we will also uh, place additional um, founding strategies, like a deep tech fund for founders which are creating technology and don't already have a business case, but where we can see that this technology will be breaking technology and will end up in successful products and therefore we can spend or we can do fundings for a longer period of time, patient money for 10 to 20 years and furthermore. And so upcoming measures will come and additionally to all the things that we are doing in the space sector, as you know, Germany is also very interested in new space startups. We have a very vibrant new space startup scene out there. We are, for instance, investing nearly 30 million euros in the CSCS program of the European Space Agency, the Commercial Space Transportation Services, where we want to buy the first flight of micro-launcher entrepreneurs, which brings to three very, very interesting new companies uh, that we have here uh, and um, we are uh, supporting in all the other fields of new space companies, for instance, when it comes to data. And I believe that data is key when it comes to the digital, digital uh, society. And, and COVID-19 is a booster for the digitalization of the society. And um, if you uh, look what is possible with all the data from space, it's obvious that you need a cloud infrastructure. And therefore, we also have startups, for instance, Cloudio or Up42. And we have very interesting startups uh, working on this, uh, uh, on this uh, data cloud infrastructure that we have uh, from space data. And uh, so therefore, one of our uh, core initiatives is this InnoSpace Masters. And uh, so a very big thank you for the organizers, especially for, for Zeitler organizing all this and the team of the DLR and the private partners. And um, we uh, see a lot of interesting startup also benefiting from this program here. Uh, two examples I can tell you about is one startup is Nucleus VR. It was the winner of InnoSpace Masters and the ESA Big Startup Challenge in 2018. And they utilize VR and AR for Industry 4.0 applications, enabling simultaneous working in remote places using digital twins. And the software was originally intended for applications on the International Space Station. It could be a of great use on Earth as well during a global pandemic that requires you to stay at home and collaborate remotely. And the second instance is uh, Valley Space, some of you may already be familiar with. Incubate of the ESA Big Northern Germany and it was also supported by the already mentioned Hightech Gründerfonds in 2018. Contrary to traditional Documenting-based engineering Valley Space is a data-driven engineering software that complements modern model-based systems engineering methods into a full digital and collaborative engineering workflow. And we are supporting all your initiatives beside of InnoSpace Masters and ESA Bix with also our Digital Hub initiative, which consists out of 12 digital hubs that we have all over Germany. And it's a network that brings together startups, companies, and researchers. So I guess you are all benefiting out of this and right now we think we are at the end of this very interesting day here right now. I have to thank the partners. I uh, already thank to DLR and Franziska Zeitler but we also have here the ESA Bix, Airbus, OHB and the DB Nets AG which are supporting uh, this uh, InnoSpace Masters and, um, and that's the end.
so to say. And now I think my core job is to present the winners right now. And therefore, I guess I have to make it a little bit dramatic. So we have reached the highlight of today's event and the announcement of the winner of the Inno Space Master 2020. Today is the first place, the winner, really, right now, upcoming, the winner of all this is Dr. Markus Kruzig and Professor Dr. Yannick Wolters from Humboldt University Berlin and Technical University Berlin with their idea QM SEC, Quantum Memories for Secure Communications. So, I can applause to this and congratulations to you and your team. I wish you all the best for realizing your project and my compliments for your strong research and your strong technology. And I'm personally very much interested in seeing what comes out of this. And I believe strong commer commercialization is the aim of all this. I wish you all the best and now good luck. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so we have to thank you really for that and for believing in us and believing in our vision. So this all started with three of us having a discussion over a coffee and now, yeah, we, we, we are close to, to bring this to reality. That's uh, amazing. What would you say? Yes. And and besides um, that, this prize is, of course, an acknowledgement for, for the specific project. Um, it moreover shows that um, quantum technologies and all the other applications of quantum technologies have such a big importance in, in the field of space applications. And uh, I think this prize is then also a recognition to all um, the projects and all the missions which have been uh, realized so far uh, with the support of the DLR. Uh, yes, so similar to what Yannick and <clears throat> Marcus mentioned, I couldn't have imagined we could uh, push it this far. So I specifically moved to Berlin to work on this project with Yannick and Marcus a uh, year and a half ago. So I couldn't have imagined and thank you for your appreciation of our work. Also from my side, congratulations to Berlin. You, the winners of winners, so to speak, the uh, overall winner. But there is one more, and that is you, the audience. For the very first time ever, there is the Audience Award. And you had the opportunity to vote for your particular favorite pitch and thus participate in the nomination of the InnoSpace Masters Best Pitch 2019-2020. And we've just learned from Berlin that a little drama is required to come up with the winner. So we go slow and I will say to you, the winner, your winner, the winner of the Audience Award this year is... Yes, and here he is, Dr. Farzad Vizali. Enjoy the applause. I hope it warms the cockles of your hearts and all the best and congratulations also from our side. Well, and having said that, we're coming to the end, but not without a few words to you. If you would like to get in touch with the winning teams, for example, you will find the contact information on the InnoSpace Masters website. And you should be able to see the link in the stream. On the website, you can also find challenge descriptions, prizes, dates and further information on the new round of the Inner Space Masters. The database opens, as you've learned, for submission on October the 30th, 2020. So, not too long from today. And thanks a lot to all contributors of today's first virtual Inner Space Masters Conference and Awards Ceremony. And also thanks to you, the online, the online audience, for your attendance and your very active participation in the Audience Award. And now it's time to say goodbye. I try to remind you of one of the great innovators we had, Steve Jobs. In one of his famous presentations, he said at the very end, Stay foolish, stay hungry. 
that's what I recommend you to do. But in these days, I would also recommend you to stay healthy. Goodbye.